All right. So now that we've just finished talking about covalent ceramics and silicate structures, this is the perfect time to move into the study of glasses. Because when we talk about glass, we're typically talking about silicate glasses. And so in this chapter, in this section, we're going to look at the formation, structure, and properties of glasses. And so let's start with some of the basics of silicate glasses. Okay. So again, funny picture involving my dog, but uh, beyond that, um, here's another quiz question for you. Uh, and this is kind of a, a brainstorming exercise, so there's not one correct answer or anything. But we, um, we uh, talked about quartz in the previous chapter, and, uh, and I talked very briefly about fused quartz, which is the amorphous form. So tell me, um, see if you can list some differences between these two materials. Maybe you know something, or maybe you can just infer based on the names and the discussion we've previously had. So brainstorm some differences, and then we'll come back and we will discuss. All right, so let's take a look at this. And so depending on what your responses were, but quartz is that 3D network structure we talked about in the previous chapter on uh, silicate structures and it has a 3d network and it's also periodic and it has long range order and it's crystalline right so those are the big defining features of quartz fused quartz even though it is quartz it does not have a crystal structure it does not have long range order it is sio2 so it's silica but the fused part means it's amorphous so this is the glass so this is basically pure glass. It's only SiO2, um, but it's the amorphous version. So it's kind of a misnomer to call it quartz, but it is uh, glass. All right. So we know from the last chapter that we had these SiO4 tetrahedron as the building block for quartz and for the, all those silicate structures. And the same is true for amorphous silicates that we have. Um, however, the bond angles in the Si... O S I bonds. So basically this bond right here, right? So these are the bridged oxygens that we talked about. And in quartz, they have very distinct 144 degree angles. However, um, this is a very complex structure. And so when it becomes amorphous uh, with no long range structure, there's a uh, an error associated with that 144 degree angle. So it can be plus or minus 10 degrees. And that's what gives it a more uh, or a less periodic. And so it has doesn't have that long range order anymore. And so you get something that looks more like this, right? So there's not that specific bond angle between the uh, silicon oxygen and silicon bond angle. You have something more like this. But it still has a network, right? It still has the network that you see here. All the uh, tetrahedron are bonded together. So they're the same in that regard, but the bond angle can be varied for the amorphous version. So when we really get into most glasses, silicate-based glasses, they are not fused quartz because fused quartz is, um, has a very high working temperature and so it can make uh, it can be a problem, right? We have to go to very high temperatures to manufacture it, and so that's can always be an issue with too high temperatures. So what we do is we typically add things called network modifiers. Again, I briefly mentioned this in the last chapter, but network network modifiers are those alkali alkali earth metals that increase the number of non-bridging or NBOs and they break up the network. So basically uh, sodium in this case is acting in that, that role. So anytime a sodium comes in, it breaks up the bridged oxygens and you get a you know, more broken up network in this case. So that's important because it makes it harder to crystallize and therefore easier to become an amorphous silicate or glass. And so increasing these modifiers um, makes it easier to uh, uh, form a glass and also does it at lower temperatures, making it more economical. So let's look at some of the various compositions and the various uh, amounts of things that we have to add. So those network modifiers, though again, sodium, so sodium oxide, but also potassium, 
magnesium, calcium, and lead can all be uh, act in that same role as network modifier. The things that are called network formers, these form the network, right? So the SiO2, so your silicon is definitely going to be in there, right? So you see uh, SiO2 is the predominant element, but also uh, boron oxide and aluminum oxide can also contribute to the tetrahedral network that we see, uh, but those to a less extent. Um, and so here you see fused, quart, uh, fused silica or fused quartz is mostly SiO2. There can be impurities in it, but for the most part, it's just SiO2. But you see over here that it softens at 1600 Celsius, which is very high. And so once we put other additives like these network modifiers, you see that the temperatures go down uh, basically half or less. And so that makes it more workable uh, in more traditional furnaces. So fused quartz is a material, fused silica is a common material, but it's more high end. It costs more because it is higher to, to melt. And then all these others are typically lower temperatures, and so they're easier to work. And so some of them are greatly reduced in cost. All right, so let's look more some more at common glasses and their compositions. And so this is just an additive uh, and uh, you know, some more uh, expanded on what we just saw. So the again, the, the main thing you're gonna see is SiO2. Very few uh, have something else. Um, and then um, aluminum is kind of less common as you see down here. You can have some iron, but you see the numbers are very low. Calcium tends to be uh, you know less than 20%. Magnesium pretty, small uh, barium oxide is very low as well sodium can be up to you know 20 percent or less you see that's a pretty common additive in all of these and then potassium smaller amounts and so forth so you see a lot of different ones uh, the other um, uh, one i'd bring to your attention is uh, boron oxide um, you see here that most of them don't have it but down here uh, what you call borosilicates um, have quite a bit. And so if you're familiar with Pyrex, uh, the thermal shock resistant uh, cookware, uh, that is made out of borosilicate. So basically these are very shock resistant to changes in temperature. And so it's very useful for those applications. And so if you've ever heard of borosilicate, it means it has boron oxide. So these are just some different uh, compositions. And the one thing I'll kind of uh, draw your attention to is all of these that are called flint glass, container flint. This is the most common type of glass you see in containers and windows and things like that. And so you have about 70 or 80% silicon, small amounts of uh, aluminum and iron, but mostly you see about 10% calcium and you see about 15% sodium. So I draw your attention to this because MS in MSE 407, uh, we talk a lot about our flint glass that we use. And so here are some uh, some compositions that you can kind of use for comparison. And flint glass is also uh, more or less uh, the soda, soda lime glass here too. So uh, very similar to soda lime glass in composition. And in fact, kind of used interchangeably. Soda lime or flint are basically the, the same thing. All right, so looking at those different compositions, um, we just talked about the container flint or what's known as soda, soda lime glass. And so what I want you to do is, uh, using kind of what we've talked about so far, see if you can decide why container flint is so much more prevalent than fused quartz, right? So your uh, glass bottle that you might have in front of you is not made out of fused quartz, it's made out of container flint. So tell me why you think that is. So pause the video, answer this in the quiz, and then come back and uh, we will uh, discuss a bit. All right, so hopefully you've had a chance to answer this and decide which one or why you think soda lime is more prevalent than fused quartz. And this really gets back to what we saw in this table here. So fused quartz or fused silica has a softening temperature of 1600 degrees. So if we want to form this into tubes or bottles or anything, we would have to heat up this material to 1600 degrees Celsius. Lots of energy goes into that furnace. And so it requires a lot of energy and therefore it's going to cost a lot. So you can buy fused quartz, uh, particularly for the academic setting or research when you're trying to uh, have something that's very resistant to temperature, 
you can use fused quartz, but it's very expensive. And so it's not common for the everyday items. However, if you're trying to make a bottle, you know, you don't need um, that purity and, and so forth and that uh, temperature um, capability, right? We don't need to go up to 1200 degrees. So the soda lime composition, which is closer to, to these down here in the seven to 800 range, um, only has to be heated up to seven or 800 degrees before it softens. And so that furnace that heats up the glass only has to go up to seven or 800 degrees to be able to form, to, to soften the glass so that we can form it into a bottle or other shapes. So that's the important thing. That's the main thing. So it's these properties, but the properties dictate the cost. And so that's kind of what I was after here with this question.